Um, it's supposed to be up here right Yes, now. you're playing. Oh, I'm playing. Okay. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat. Repeat the sounding joy. In the world, let sin and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow. For as the curse is found, for as the curse is found, for as, for as the curse is found. The world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his love. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, welcome to Lakeview Church for the Hanging of the Greens. It's going to be a great night tonight. You know, Thanksgiving's finally over, right? So the Christmas music can start. Uh, I, I, Cheryl always, she likes to start Christmas music about September. I like to start it about December 24th. But <clears throat> listen, Christmas is coming. Families are coming. Turkey and dressing, Santa, the elves, the snowmen, all the goofy hats. Uh, Buddy the Elf is coming. Uh, that's my wife's favorite show. Uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is coming. Uh, today on the TV, I heard, I heard uh, Bing Crosby and Andy Williams, and, and I know Mariah Carey's coming with hers. But, you know, in the middle of all of this, the reason for this season is because Jesus is already coming. In fact, he's already here. Uh, the Messiah is here. The Savior of the world is here. The God of the universe has come to visit us. And what a thing to celebrate. Amen? So I think it's, I think it's in, uh, interesting, though. We as Americans, we certainly as Christians, we've packed so much into the four weeks between Thanksgiving and December 25th, Christmas, um, that there don't seem to be enough time or energy uh, for us to consider the Messiah, the Messiah uh, that we're celebrating. And, and I don't think we've done that on purpose. Uh, I, we haven't purposely taken Christ out of Christmas, but with all of our busyness, we've just kind of buried him under layers of snow and presents and decorations and family traditions and food and all of that stuff. I mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes, sometimes Christmas seems like trying to fill, to put five pounds of fun into a three pound bag. Amen. It just, it's just not enough time. We gripe all the way through the season. We don't think about how special the time is. And sometimes, you know, my, my Christmas schedule, my, de my December schedule, it just seems like it fills my calendar kind of like, um, <laughs> kind of like a takeout con container from Golden Corral, right? I mean, you just fill it up to the point where it don't shut anymore. So, uh, but, but I'll tell you this, I, our, our goal this year, and starting with tonight, is that we consider what a great Savior that we have. And much like the shepherds we talked about this morning, let's experience Jesus Christ this Christmas. So tonight, our purpose is not merely to decorate the sanctuary. We could do that any time. And it's not to put Christ back into Christmas, because Christ is Christmas, Amen, right? sure is. Our purpose tonight for this Christmas year is to experience and to learn how to experience Christ all around us in everything that we do. In every wreath, in every Christmas light, every candle, every tree, every holly bush, every ornament, every stocking, every gift, so that in every meal, it smacks us right into the goodness of God. So when you drive through Christmas light shows this year, or you listen to Handel's Messiah, 
or Mary did you know, you cannot help but say, glory to God in the highest. O come, O come, Emmanuel, joy to the world. Church, our prayer tonight <laughs> is that during this next four weeks and everything we do and everything we see, in the midst of being constantly bombarded by all kinds of commercialization, that we slow ourselves down and we see Jesus. Because Jesus truly is the reason for the season. Join us tonight as we worship Jesus and as we participate in the hanging of the greens. Please stand with me as we uh, recite this prayer together. Our Father, we long, we long for the simple beauty of Christmas, of Christmas for, for all the old familiar melodies, words, and symbols that, that remind us of that great, great miracle when He who had made all things came one night as a babe. You're only begotten to be born to chosen earthly parents, but in that longing, let us even more yearn for your renewed presence among us, even as we celebrate the coming of your Son. Before such mystery we kneel, as we follow the shepherds and wise men to bring you the gift of our love, a love we confess that has not always been as warm or sincere or real as it should have been. Now, as we enter into this Christmas season, we pray that love would find its beloved, and from you we the grace to make it pure again, warm and real. Great Lord, by your mercy, guide our outward actions in such ways that our inward being is formed in faith, hope, and love. May, May the, the decorations we offer engage our senses during this Christmas season, season and enliven our, our praise and worship of you, our great Almighty God. God. In the, the name, name of the, the child of Bethlehem, Bethlehem our risen and coming, coming Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you remain standing as we sing, O come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. For you alone are worthy. For you alone are worthy. For you seated. <clears throat> Candles have been used in worship for centuries. The ancient tabernacle and temple of God held lamps that burned continually in God's presence to remind the Israelites that God spoke to Moses in a burning bush and led them through the desert with a pillar of fire. Isaiah 9 prophesies of a day when light will come, not just to Moses on the mountain or the, to the priest in the temple, but to all who are lost, wandering in the darkness. Isaiah 9 says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. The people walking in the darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. Okay, for, for to us, a child is born. 
To us, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will never be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and, and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So whenever you see candles this Christmas, remember that the long-awaited day has come. Light was born into darkness when Jesus was born in a manger. Would you stand with us as we worship together? Here I am to worship. Almost all of us put evergreen wreaths on our doors at Christmas, and as a church, we also hang wreaths on doors as a sign of welcome. These wreaths originated as signs of unending life and of victory in pagan celebrations, but Christianity eventually realized that Christ is the ultimate victor, 
and the doorway to eternal, unending life. Psalms 24 instructs us to lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, O you ancient doors. Then the ruler of glory will come in. Who is the ruler of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. So this Christmas, as you pass through doors adorned in, with wreaths, May you again remember that Jesus paid for your salvation and now invites you to pass through the narrow gate and live for all eternity. May every wreath door be an opportunity to recommit your life to Jesus. The most striking and the most universal feature of Christmas is the use of evergreens in churches and homes. Still, many traditions involving greenery originated in Druid, Cult, Norse, and Roman civilizations. The color green represents eternal life, and so plants that remain green throughout the year played an important role in these celebrations. Because the use of greenery had pagan origins, early church leaders often objected to their use. But as these people groups converted to Christianity and learned to worship the one true God, evergreens were used to teach God's unchanging character. Malachi 3.6 says, I, the Lord, do not change. 
Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. From now on, when you see greenery, remember that you can trust God and his promises. We can celebrate Christmas because we know that Jesus is not going to change his mind about saving us and giving us eternal life. Most of our Christmas traditions are European in origin, but the Christmas poinsettia originated in North America. Poinsettias are native to Mexico and Central America. Catholic priests use their December star-shaped blooms to illustrate the flaming star that appeared over Bethlehem, which announced the bright and morning star of Revelation. So when you see these foreign plants that are so prevalent during Christmas, remember the star that led the foreign magi to the place where the Christ child was. May you also be reminded that we were foreigners to Israel when our ancestors converted to Christ. And remember too, the Christians all around the world and the people in countries and places that still have not heard the good news about the baby boy born in Bethlehem. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining afar through shadows dim, giving a light for those who long have gone, guiding the wise men on their way unto the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawn. Guiding the wise men on their 
the way unto the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Beautiful star, the hope of light, guiding the pilgrim through the night, over the mountain till the break of dawn. Into the light of perfect day, it will give out a lovely ray. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. O oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawns. Give us the light to light the way unto the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Beautiful star, the hope of rest for the redeemed, the good and the blessed. Yonder in glory when the crown is won. Jesus is now that star divine, brighter and brighter he will shine. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. O oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawn. Give us the light to light the way unto the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Today the Christmas tree is in the center of our festivities. Glittering with lights and ornaments, it is part of the beauty and meaning of Christmas. However, in times past, ancient peoples, including non-Jewish people, would decorate trees with golden lights in order to worship false gods and to celebrate fertility and prosperity. Jeremiah 10, 3 through 5 tells us, For the customs of the peoples are worthless. They cut a tree out of the forest, and a craftsman shapes it with his chisel. They adorn it with silver and gold, they fasten it with a hammer, and nails so it will not totter. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field, their idols cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do any good. Likewise, the Greeks and Romans would decorate trees to worship Zeus and Saturn, respectively. So the Christmas tree, more than any other symbol, should remind us of the dangers of idolatry. You and I are constantly prone to worship other gods, like materialism, the American dream, or even our own children and families. So this year, whenever you look at a Christmas tree, ask yourself, what God or gods do I worship? Am I putting family or presents or even decorations first in my Christmas? We must worship the God who died on a tree for all those who believe.
Those men did a pretty good job, didn't they, ladies? Phil's only so tall. I noticed he was trying to get that middle for you. Let's see if the youth can do just as well. On Christmas trees, we place all kinds of decorations, many with sentimental value and others with spiritual importance. Tonight, we will hang a series of decorations sometimes called Christmans. Christmans are not that old. They were invented in 1957 by a woman named Frances Spencer. While making homemade decorations for her church's Christmas tree, Mrs. Spencer based her designs on the ancient symbols of the church to constantly remind us that Christmas is not about us, but it's about Him, Jesus. So as you see beautiful decorations on Christmas trees all about you, may they remind you that Christmas is not about us, but it is all about Jesus. Let's stand together as we worship. Go ahead. So 
Small white lights are used on our tree. Jesus referred to himself as the light of the world. Yet another place in scripture he says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people need to hide a light under a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. While candles remind us that Jesus is the one true light, let each of these lights represent each person who makes up the body of Christ. Each bulb emits only a small light and is ineffective alone, but together they dazzle in the darkness and the overwhelm the senses. So go, as you leave this place, let your light shine for him. And each time you see Christmas lights, be reminded that it is Jesus who is, and we also are to be lights in our world.
Possibly the best known Christian Christmas symbol is the nativity scene. This decoration reminds us most of the true meaning of Christmas, the scene of Bethlehem where the Christ child was born, a manger filled with hay, the stable, the animals, shepherds and angels all remind us of the first Christmas gift ever, God's gift of his son to all mankind. Well, how about that? Looks a little different than it did when we started, amen? In the first chapter of uh, Luke, the Bible says, verse 31 to, to Mary, well, verse 30 says, the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, you've found favor with God. You'll be with child and give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus. He'll be great and will be called the son of the most high the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Then if you go over to the book of Matthew, in uh, chapter 26 and verse 26, we bookend the life of Jesus. Came in a manger, left after a cross, going into a borrowed tomb, showing he had power over death. But in verse 26, he's with his disciples. He knows the end is near. And even though he's told them, they don't quite understand what's going on. But listen to the words here. It says in verse 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant 
which is poured out for many for the gift for the uh, forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I'll not drink from the fruit of the vine uh, from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Verse 30 says, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The most special thing we'll do tonight is what we're about to do in this time of communion. Communion means to commune. It means to connect with somebody. And so our, our uh, goal tonight, um, our wish tonight, our desire tonight is to commune with or to connect with the God that we speak about. Is that a good idea? So there are four tables at the four corners of this room. And so what your, what your job is, there'll be a deacon at each one of these, kind of help you out over there. And so you're going to take the juice and the bread. If you'd like, go with your family. If your family is not here, connect with somebody else. Just, there's an old game, that, you, know, you know, get in groups of three, get in groups of two. Listen, get in group with somebody. Just if you don't have somebody to go with after the families kind of that are all together, kind of go. Find somebody that's here. Or raise your hand and give me a chance or give one of our deacons or one of our staff a chance to go with you and connect with us tonight. You'll miss something really special if you don't. Now, I want to make sure I get the instructions right this year because last year we took our candles and went back to the chairs. We're not going to do that tonight. So you're going to go and you're going to partake of the bread and of the juice. You're going to take a candle and you're going to light it and you're going to place it in that bowl full of salt or whatever it is there. And, uh, and, and then you'll return with your family or by yourself to your seat. Does that make sense? But before we do that, um, we're going to have a word of prayer. And um, in, I think it's 1 Corinthians, it talks about to search yourself and to partake of this in a manner worthy to God. And what that means is that we're going to ask God to forgive us of anything that would stand in the way of us being pure and clean in front of him. If, if we'll confess our, our sins to him, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of all unrighteousness. We're going to take advantage of that tonight. So maybe you as a family would like to stand up from where you are. You'd like to come to the, to the altar maybe and pray for God to give you a clean heart and clean spirit and then go to any one of these tables. Maybe you want to go straight to the tables. That is completely up to you. Do you understand the instructions? I did a good job or a really bad job of telling you those uh, instructions. So well, let's do that right now. I'm going to pray and then we'll begin. Father, we just come to you tonight, Lord, seeing something very special already and experiencing something very special. And so tonight as we finish up this wonderful time that we've had together, I pray, Father, that you would be with us, go with us as we... Um, we ask, Lord, that our hearts and lives be clean before you. And then as we go to these tables, Lord, uh, to commune with you, Lord, I pray that we'd experience this time, we'd experience Christmas and everything we do. Lord, thank you for everyone that's been a part of this tonight. It was certainly something uh, worthwhile and, and, and very moving. So thank you, Lord, for that experience. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now,